this morning, um, Eric Barger is going to come up here and share a message about what's going on in the church, really the apostasy that's going on. And it's interesting because Jude tells us, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That's the battle line. It's the faith. It's not, well, it's what we believe today. It's what the faith has always been. And that faith has been entrusted to each of us. And we have to contend for it. It's a battle. It's not time to just whatever happens, happens. We know that it's the last days and things are going to get worse. No, God is admonishing us to contend for the faith. And you have to know who your enemy is and you have to know what the battle's all about. And that's what Eric is going to share about this morning. So let's welcome Eric uh, Barger up here from Take a Stand Ministries. Uh, so far there we go all right well glad to be here with you pastor and I've been talking about uh, me coming and sharing with you oh I don't know for at least a year maybe more but uh, when we started talking about uh, I asked him what he wanted what, what he thought uh, topically because I do a lot of different topics spiritual warfare the cults the occult a lot of the current events Bible prophecy all those things but he said tell us what's going on in the church and we kind of came to that conclusion this uh, what I'm going to give you this morning is um, uh, new territory for me last night in the hotel between 11 and about 12:30. Uh, I was putting a number of new slides into this presentation and so uh, this is something I don't know how long it's going to take we might be here till a quarter till three ladies so you know I don't think so I'm teasing but uh, uh, but at any rate, yeah, the Packers aren't playing today, are they? Okay, we're all right then. All right. The Bears are. Well, I got news for you. Many of you know that uh, I'm part of Jan Markell's radio team and on their board. And, and it was my idea that we have our board meeting tomorrow night when the Seahawks are playing the Saints. <laughs> How we did that, I don't know, because I've been a Seahawks fan since the very beginning when they couldn't win a game. Sorry. We all have our teams, don't we? Anyway, but I did that to myself, and here I am going to be in a board meeting tomorrow evening and have to, oh, well, that's the, that's the breaks. That's inconsequential to the whole scheme of things, isn't it? Come on, everybody knows we all have our, our things we enjoy in life, but really when you get down to it, uh, uh, what we're going to talk about this morning is serious stuff, and it's a... It's certainly uh, different than the outcome of football games. But I am, I'm glad to be here with you and uh, share this material. Uh, people have told me often through these years that uh, what I do is, they'll say, you know, I heard some of that and I heard some of this and I heard some of that, but you put it together all in one place and I understand it better or I understand uh, how it works better. And I hear that a lot, um, that people may have heard some of this material before and some of you here certainly have heard some of this. Uh, I believe you have uh, a station manager and a pastor who have apologetic minds. That doesn't mean they're sorry about stuff, by the way. You all know, <laughs> apo yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know him personally. Maybe we should do counseling, but, <laughs> but uh, we do know, know each other personally, seriously. But, uh, uh, you know, apologetics is a Bible school term for the defense of the faith. And so uh, that's a little of what I'll be doing here this morning. Uh, many of you know my background, my past, where I came from. I was a rock musician. I was a record producer, recording engineer. I was a drug addict for 14 years. I was an alcoholic. I was a New Ager before the public ever called it New Age. And uh, if God can save me, if he can forgive me, then everybody's a candidate. So don't give up praying for anybody you're currently praying for because he can change us and he changed me. And so 31 years now, we've been um, in full-time ap apologetic ministry, traveling the country, apologetics and discernment, really the same thing, talking about the issues of the day. And really all I do is take the issues that are going on around us, especially in the church, and just shine the light of scripture on them. And that's what we're gonna do uh, here this morning with, with this message. I encourage you to go to our website and use it as a resource. I'll get all this out of the way right now so we can just zoom right into the, the actual message. But our website is ericbarger.com. 
Uh, all of my last book is there free of charge. Most of my second to last book, all of our booklets, articles, newsletters, any of the radio shows, whether it was mine, which is now defunct, I'm not doing my own show anymore. That's how we met. I was on the station here uh, for some time. And now with Chan Markell, anything that I do on radio is on there. A lot of our videos are on there. Uh, we're linked to our YouTube channel and so on. You can find us all over the place, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. You'll find it. I never, never dreamed I ever say Eric Barger tweets, but that happens <laughs> regularly. So uh, we also do a free newsletter and there are, there are slips out there on the, on the book table. And if you uh, want to afterward, we'd be glad to mail the newsletter to you. It's free of charge. We also do an email newsletter. Uh, it's different than the print newsletter. They aren't the same thing, but we'd be glad to get you both of those publications when they come out, articles by myself and others that we think are worth their salt. And it's always free, and we never divulge your name or information to anybody else. Again, uh, you'll hear us on Understanding the Times Radio right here on your radio station. And, of course, Take a Stand Radio, all those podcasts are still online. I'll talk a little about the book table because we do have a special for you that uh, will relate to this morning's message. All right. Uh, this morning... And if you want to take notes, by the way, I encourage you, especially to write down the scriptures. I discourage you from trying to write it all down because you're not going to make it. It'll be very frustrating. Don't even think about doing it. Uh, this all started last summer when our radio producer, Larry Kutzler, came to me and said, let's do a program about these new kind of confused evangelicals. And I said, that's a, that's a great title, Larry. He hadn't thought of that. But I said, let's call it the new, improved, truly confused evangelicals. Because uh, when you look at the emergent church and so many of the things that are happening inside of evangelical circles, they, they all call themselves evangelicals. Uh, that's one of those terms you can't trust anymore. It used to be if somebody said evangelical, you knew what they meant. People who aren't aware of what's happening around them inside the church still use that term and don't think anything about it. But uh, these days, if I say I'm an evangelical in a public setting where it's not among Christians who understand what I'm talking about, I feel like I've got to get a, a paragraph of, of definition in to tell them what I mean by evangelical because things have changed. Uh, times have changed. And by the way, um, I didn't leave the evangelicals. They left me, you know, because all I've said is let's stay with the Bible. But that's way too old fashioned for the postmodern generation. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. The perils of postmodern Christianity. Uh, in my mind, when you say postmodern Christianity, it's almost like saying Christian cocaine. These are words that are hard to, to, uh, to marry up with each other, but a lot of postmoderns call themselves Christians, and we're going to discuss what postmodernism is and uh, what it is in correlation to the church. And some of the faces there, you know some of them, you've seen some of them. We've talked about some of them and uh, other messages and so on. By the way, I'm going to shoot this on DVD in about two weeks. So we'll be doing this, and actually three videos I'm going to shoot while I'm home off the road in uh, December. You know, December is classically called the evangelist starving period. You're going to the Bahamas. Hmm. <laughs> I've been there and I love it, but uh, I'll be uh, home in Seattle slaving away, working on new materials. So that's what we'll be doing while we're off the road. So. What is postmodernism? You know, the arguments abound as to what this is. And people have different definitions. You know, if you live in a time when people are making up their own rules, making up their own definitions for what words mean, well, then the very idea of postmodernism is going to have the same problem. It's going to have lots of definitions that uh, from one person to the next, they're going to say different things. Uh, many definitions could fit what this is, but generally postmodernism or the postmodern age are today the people between say 16 and 45 and that's a very broad figure. I've always said that 20 something and 30 something people in our culture are the postmoderns but I backed that out both directions a little bit because now we see postmodern thinking coming into high schools and certainly into people who could be grandparents. I was a grandparent at 45 so I know that that's possible and so uh, generally it's the 16 to 45 year olds uh, they, uh, the standard of postmodernism is relativism. Now, that's a standardless standard. But the idea that the rules are what you make them, that truth is a moving target, that what you've always thought was right before may not be right today, or what was wrong before may not be wrong today. And we have entire generations now who have been schooled in our American government school system with this kind of thinking at the core of it. It's come through the curriculum, it's come through the universities, it's come into the classrooms at all ages. 
Relativism is the standard and truth is personally interpreted. We have a whole generation of people around us. When you tell them that something's right or wrong, they will argue with you because they'll tell you that's only your opinion. That's your standard of right and truth. And it really comes back to what is truth. That, uh, that uh, line we've all heard from so many places. I heard a great message by Frank Peretti one time about what is truth. And he put a chair in the middle of the platform and he said, if we could turn the lights off in this room so no one could see anything, he said, it'd be dangerous, we did. But he said, if we did that, and I moved away from that chair. After I turned around a couple times, I might not be sure where the chair was. If I was close enough to it, I could probably find it again. But what if I got too far away from that chair? If that chair was truth, after a while, if I wander away from it, I might not be able to ever find it again. That's really what's happening in our culture. And um, I think that's, that may be the best way to explain postmodernism. Nothing is absolute. Everything is up for consideration. So when you talk about postmodernism, now it has moved inside the walls of the church. And that doesn't surprise us with some of the, the modernistic churches. It doesn't surprise us with some of the old mainline denominational churches. Not that every person that's in those churches is not saved and not that every pastor in those churches isn't saved. But I can tell you that there's a great percentage that aren't because they believe something besides the gospel. They have the form of Christianity, but without the power thereof, as Paul said. And so uh, it, it's not that everybody in those other churches, the mainline churches, uh, are, are, are somehow uh, outside the walls of Christianity, but a lot of postmodernism has made its way in those churches too. It was for the last 1900 or so years in Christianity that absolutes and truth came from the Bible. But today in postmodernism, we have subjectivity and skepticism that have taken the place of absolutes and truth. Absolutes are now rejected in the postmodern generation. Subjectivity, the idea that you make in your own rules, your own scheme of things, whatever truth is, has become the methodology. Truth is now relative. It's really a moving target, as I said, and skepticism becomes the result. And we have a whole generation of people around us who are skeptical about Christianity, about the things that have been taught in Christianity, about the, especially about the doctrines and the history of Christianity. We have a whole generation. And ladies and gentlemen, those things, that thinking doesn't stop at the door of a good church. It makes its way into good churches. Now, some of the people, uh, they're not gonna stay in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, Bible-preaching church very long because it certainly doesn't fit their mold. But some people make it their job to come in and try to change the church and revolutionize congregations into believing this new idea that the rules are up to you and maybe we really can't trust the Bible. That's the bottom line to it. And you're going to hear me say that several times in the next few minutes. What suffers most because of this philosophy is simply the biblical truth, doctrine, and practice aren't what they once were to many people and it's happening inside evangelical churches. Now, let me take you back, and I think I might have a slide for this, but not knowing these slides in this presentation very well, some of these I just can get memorized after you do it a while, you know, but uh, that's the advantage I have over the pastor who gets one shot at you on Sunday morning with a message. But, but I get to, to refine these things. And, uh, but, you know, here's what happens is, as you take, go back and, and you see what's going on. 150 years ago, the evangelicals, though that word wasn't used very much, were the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the uh, Disciples of Christ, the Presbyterians. Now, some of those churches I just named, some of you know, yeah, there are good people who are saved people in some of those places. But these days, you don't know what you're going to get if you walk into one of those churches on a Sunday morning. Who knows what you're going to hear? And chances are you're going to be listening to somebody who really doesn't believe the Bible is truth and certainly doesn't believe it from cover to cover. And that's the problem is that thinking is happening now in what I've called, and I think you're going to see a slide about this, a satanic redo is going on right now because the evangelicals of our day are being destroyed the very same way that the evangelicals of that day some few decades ago were destroyed because it worked so well then. Why should the devil change? It worked great then. Just get people to depend on themselves instead of the scriptures. And that's really what it comes down to. The warnings started long ago. Harry Ironside was a pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago. And I think he was there 19 years. I believe he retired just about 1940. But uh, Harry Ironside said, truth mixed with error 
is equivalent to all error except that it's more innocent looking and therefore more dangerous. Now before I found that quote, I used to say, you know, stuff that's packaged that the church doesn't realize it's going on and how they're being kind of dumbed down or how the church is being changed into something the Bible doesn't say, that's way more dangerous than blatant Satanism because even the world can recognize that blatant Satanism is, is off target. Well, at least most of the world. It used to be everybody in the secular world looked at witchcraft, paganism, and Satanism, and that kind of stuff with angst and with, with uh, disfavor. But as you know today, that's what's selling in the movies. So we have uh, generations who have been dumbed down about that too, because we've been, uh, we're the first generation in history that uh, has been schooled to believe the occult is normal. And by the way, that'll be my message at Jan Markell's conference in April. So uh, we're doing two a year, by the way, now. So uh, we're talking about the occult being normal. We, we live in a very strange day when you can say, make that kind of statement, that's for sure. Charles Spurgeon, one of the great uh, uh, heralds of the church, said discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It is knowing the difference between right and almost right. You know, when you talk about the scriptures, we need to be accurate, don't we? To our best ability. I'm still learning, as I'm sure every one of you here are. I'm, I'm sure Pastor would say the same thing if it was him up here talking. We're all still learning. Uh, nobody has a complete grip on all the, uh, the scripture. It's a lifelong journey. But um, Spurgeon was right about this, that we've got to know the difference between right and almost right. And just because somebody uses Christian jargon, Christian terms, or claims to be a Christian, or says the word evangelical, I think we need to put it all to the test. That doesn't mean we become testy. That, that doesn't mean we become uh, 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 holier than thou. It doesn't mean that we, that we uh, become, um, uh, what's the word, paranoid, you know, but we put everything to the test. And if we are in the end of the end of the end days, where I believe we are, uh, if we are there, then it's going to get crazier as time goes on. Uh, if discernment is going to be at a real premium by the time it's all finished. You know, you always use passages like this one to discern truth from error. And Paul here in Galatians 1, and I use this passage at the beginning or close to the beginning of several messages that I have put together, several of my videos, because why go trying to reinvent the wheel when God has said it so clearly here? Galatians chapter 1, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, and that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. So we're to test everything that we've learned or we hear by the one and only true gospel, as Pastor pointed out a few minutes ago. Uh, Paul didn't say there was two or three or five or ten, no amendments, no additions, no subtractions. It's the one and only true gospel, right? He made that clear. So we take everything back to the scripture and we test it there. Now at that point, if I make that statement to a number of postmoderns, they start shaking their head and going, no, 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 because we can't trust the Bible. I had three, or maybe it was four, Bible school graduates who had just graduated from a, a school in Nashville that was once a good evangelical school. And I said, uh, fellas, we can agree on this, can't we? Can't we agree on the virgin birth, the blood atonement, salvation by, by grace? And I said, and the inerrancy of the scripture. And they said, oh, we believe those first three, but we don't believe that last one. And I said, and you learned that in, in Bible school, didn't you? And they said, well, sure. Because that's what they're being taught today in the, in the classrooms. And uh, let me tell you, if you went to Bible school in the last, if you went 20 years ago, don't support your alma mater until you know what they believe and uh, know if they're still on target because a lot of them have changed. And I think it's important we, we know that. Hmm wonder what that's all about. Uh, I think I know, I think I know that the cable was coming out if Max is back there. Okay, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Notice the scripture. I mean, that's the same one that Pastor read a few minutes ago. He didn't know I was going to use it. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude was going to write some word of education to us that we don't know what he was going to say. It's one of the great mysteries of the Bible, in my opinion. We don't know what he was going to say, 
but he was so grieved by the shape of the church and by the deception that was making its way through the front doors that he turned the entire attention of this little one chapter letter to warn the church about the deception that was coming in. Instead of the edification, it was a warning, and sometimes that's what we need. What we have here in these passages, just the two I read, there's many, many more we could read, is a warning to accept only the authentic gospel and the absolute assurance that false teachers are going to invade the church. Every one of the Americanized cults, Mormonism, the Way International, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Unity School of Christianity, and on and on and on, every one of them had their root in a Bible-believing, evangelical-style church. Every one of them. And uh, the reason those cults have flourished is because the church didn't keep their Bible open or were willing to follow a charismatic man and his teaching, someone who was very persuasive, and his teaching rather than the Scripture. I say let's stick with the Scripture. If we're the last one standing, that's okay because, hey, you know, I got to stand before God based on the Scripture, not based on the teachings of Joseph Smith, or Charles Taz Russell, or anybody else. It's the Scripture. Postmodern church leaders and their followers have one thing in common. They reject the authority and, of course, the inerrancy of the Scripture. Now, I believe it from cover to cover. And I say to people all the time, if you don't believe it all, you really don't believe it at all. This isn't, as a Texas preacher once said that I thought was put so well, this ain't no pick and choose. Uh, you know, the scriptures, after 300 years of scrutiny, finally the New Testament was put together and finalized. You think about it, it was 140 years after A.D. 0 to A.D. 140 before the church had a compilation of teachings. I have a DVD on that back there called Hath God Said. We didn't have a New Testament. We understood what we believed because we heard the apostles and their disciples teach it again and again and again and again. And that's really where I'm going here in the message because we're hearing things are completely out of kilter inside evangelical churches. Things that might be just fine for our earthly lives. But we're not hearing the doctrines of the faith. We're not hearing expository teaching unless you're at a Calvary Chapel. Uh, you're not hearing it generally. In, in the church world around us. So uh, postmodernism has invaded the church, generally known, as you know, as the emergent church movement. I'm sure there's been teaching on it here. We've done it on radio ad nauseum, the biggest selling DVD we've ever had in our ministry. And if I wrote a book on it, I'm, I think it'd probably be the same thing, is the heirs of the emergent church. We have them out there. It explains what it is. It, it gives you uh, some inroads to be able to talk to people who are involved with it. And these slides come from it, and I think it's healthy that we see them. The emerging church or emergent church movement takes its name from the idea the culture has changed and the new church must emerge to respond to the culture. So what they're really saying is the church isn't adequate the way it was and it needs to change. And you know, one of the things they changed was, was the way we dressed. Uh, this morning, the few of us have ties on. That doesn't make me any more holy than anybody else, but it used to be all the men wore ties to church. I mean, it used to be things were different. We're more casual today. And you all know that, you know, but the thing is they started monkeying around with the doctrines of the faith and deciding which ones fit and which ones didn't. When somebody starts doing that, then I got a real problem, how about you? And that was really where the emergent church went off the deep end. They were trying to figure out how to bring the postmodern kids back to church who, hadn't, who had left church because at 18, a lot of these kids had decided they didn't want to have church. They'd been in church all their lives, so they leave church at 18, 19, or 20, probably because they went to a secular educational community somewhere like a state college, and they were taught by their professors that there wasn't any God, that we've been here 4.83 billion years, that they came from apes, and they can do whatever they want to do. And so they go out and do their own thing. And so that's really what happens. The emergent church leaders are seeking a disillusionment of cold hard fact in favor of a more warm and fuzzy subjectivity that's all supposed to reach the postmoderns. And they believe that evangelicalism and fundamentalism have failed the church, but they've needed a spiritual aspect of what they do and they've adopted things that I know personally are much closer we got a problem with this, don't we? Much closer to, ev to New Age thought than to evangelical Christianity. I may have to hold that in there because there is no, um, uh, there are no mounts there, no screws to, uh, or no places for the screws to go into. All right, we're back on, Max. I may have to hold it. Evangelicals 
out there they believe have failed them. Fundamentalists have failed them. The appeal of the emergent church is to the disenfranchised or those disappointed by the traditional church setting. And many times, listen carefully, particularly in the emergent church, these are socially minded youth who have little understanding for or even a contempt for absolutes, for doctrine, tradition, and history. And now our, our churches, our seminaries are populated by postmodern people and they have a predisposed philosophy and mindset as to what I've just given you. And that's, uh, therein lies the problem. What will the next generation of the church look like is the question. What will they believe? They are truly the new confused evangelicals. Now there's a pamphlet we wrote and uh, at last count we're probably 50 or 60,000 of these have been printed and we put it online so people can print it all they want and, uh, and make a pamphlet into it. It's a PDF file that you can fold into a pamphlet and it's, it's called How to Spot the Emergent Church in Your Church and these are the six things that, that really are the capstone of that pamphlet. It's experience over reason today. It's spirituality over doctrine. It's images over words, feelings over truth, earthly justice more important than salvation, and social action over eternity. Because eternity is not spoken about. It's very nebulous inside of postmodern thinking. And if you want to print this out, you can do so by going to the address down there at the bottom of the screen. If you miss that, I'll, uh, I'll be glad to give it to you later on at the book table. Just ericbarger.com slash spot dot pdf if uh, people listening on radio want to get it. ericbarger.com slash spot dot pdf and they can print this particular um, uh, pamphlet out and use it to your heart's content, give it to your friends, that's the idea. It will help you understand that the emerging church has made its way into your church. To the orthodox Christian, truth is knowable, it's attainable, it's objective, and it's immovable. But to the postmodern, truth is relative, it's secondary, it's unattainable, and those who say they have absolutes in their life are looked at as arrogant. If we say we believe the Bible and the Bible alone, we're being told, thank you, brother, thank you. We will wait for you to do the, uh, the tape job. Thank you very much. Just tape it right about there. We rehearsed it so I could do it as fast as possible. I see. Good going. You rehearsed it. Oh. Okay. Good job. Is anybody timing him? <laughs> Thank you very much. I sure appreciate that. All right. I've, I've done way worse than holding a wire in, believe me, or had to, to make a presentation work. So truth is relative. It's secondary, unattainable, and those who hold absolutes, they're looked at as arrogant. To them, what is a, success, a successful emergent or a postmodern life? Well, it's the advancing of social justice causes. And you know, there are some injustices out there that I hope every one of us are concerned about. No doubt about that. But is that the reason that church exists or is that the reason that Jesus came? No. No, neither one of those things. See, that's not why he came. It's exploratory conversations about the life and the work of Jesus. I always find it interesting that the emergent postmodern crowd wants to talk all about Jesus and they'll They'll quote Jesus from the four Gospels, but then they say that you can't trust the Bible. You know, and I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. You're going to get an example of it later on. You'll understand that more how this is it's a conundrum for me because, I mean, if they can't trust the Bible, how do you know what you know about Jesus? I'll come back to that. Finding spiritual self-realization by incorporating mystical practices to fill the spiritual void is what it comes down to. That's the bottom line of what happens at the end of the day. And to get there, they've got to reject the orthodoxies of the past. They've got to reject what the church has always believed. They've got to reject the truths, the doctrinal truths of Scripture. And of course, they reject the authority of the Bible. Because we live in a society whose parents picked up the idea, and I was in that generation, I was in the first hippie generation, I was the first kid in my high school to get kicked out of school for having hair touch his ear, and I was the only kid at 16 that I knew was smoking dope in my high school of 3,000 students. The only one that I knew of, and I was playing in a band at Athens, Ohio, six nights a week when I was a junior in high school, and that's where I was getting dope, because you couldn't get it in my school. Imagine that today. <laughs> Imagine that today, a school where there's no dope. So. They reject the authority of the Bible. And you think about this. We live in a time when the, the parents 
of these kids, of these generations, they were the ones who thought up, do your own thing, man. If it feels good, do it. And some of you right here know what I'm talking about because you were there with me. Oh, I know you recognize me from that coffee house in Omaha. I know. Okay. I'm not personally angry at the postmoderns. Please don't take this as I'm angry. I, I'm disturbed about what's going on in the church. I'm disturbed about that. I'm disturbed how easily this stuff has come in to some of our churches. How easily these things have made their way in. And, uh, you know, it's amazing sometimes. I talk to pastors all the time who will tell me, I never dreamed that that couple was into this stuff and they've been sitting in my church for the last three years and I come to find out they've been distributing Rob Bell DVDs to people. I have that, I've had that same conversation with a dozen, 15, 20 pastors where people are just shocked about what's going on right in their very midst. While he's preaching the Bible, people out there are undermining it right inside the congregation. The emergent church, I believe, is the single deepest encroachment into one sound evangelical churches and denominations. It's the deepest thing I've ever seen. I'm saying things today about con complete denominations. And uh, some, some of my friends are pastors in a particular denomination that if I began to tell you who it is, and, and I'm not gonna get into that, but I mean, I'm saying things today I never dreamed I would say. And that particular denomination is someplace I spent 50 or 60% of my time preaching 20 years ago as I traveled. So things are happening today I never dreamed we'd ever be saying or talking about. Postmodern leaders have become enamored with the journey. It's all about the here and now. I call it the here and now gospel. But admittedly, they're not quite sure where the destination is. It's all about the journey we're taking on life together. This is Tony Jones from over in the Twin Cities, at Solomon's Church, which is uh, an emergent church of about 2,000. He says, he's called the emergent church theologian. Tough for me to say that. The emerging church is a place of conversation and dialogue and movement. Where that's going to go, we don't know. We're figuring this out together. We don't have an agenda what it looks like at the end of the road. We just want to gather up people who are on this road and want to go together on it. Now, that thinking is accepted in postmodern thought, folks. But how can anybody lead who doesn't know where they're going? I don't want to follow somebody who doesn't know where they're going. You know, my wife has to put up with me in the car when the GPS isn't working right. So I don't want to follow somebody who doesn't know where they're going. <laughs> you see, the historic position of Christianity is absolute truth, salvation, and direction for our earthly lives and for eternity. Now, let me capitalize that, for eternity, come from the Bible. But in the emergent thought, it's a set of experiences with a never-ending conversation on a journey without a specific destination. And it doesn't look too romantic when you look at it through that lens. But that's really what it comes down to. Beliefs are unimportant, they're changeable, they're relative, and the journey becomes the goal. In the emergent church, we're told that we've misunderstood the terms and the words and the phrases in the Bible, so we really don't know what Christianity is all about. And suddenly, after 1950 or so years, the emergent church has ridden onto the scene to rescue Christianity <laughs> from the evangelicals, that is, the real Bible believers, and their intent upon doing it. Phyllis Tickle is one of the uh, emergent authors. She's called a prophetess to them. And she says now some 500 years later after Luther, even many of the most diehard Protestants among us have grown suspicious of scripture and scripture only. We question what the words mean, literally, metaphorically, actually. We even question which words do and do not belong in scripture. Now that's really a capsule of what is happening. And then there's Tony Campola one of the most sought after speakers on Christian college and seminary campuses. Dr. Campola is a very captivating speaker. He's a very interesting speaker. He's very intellectual, but maybe that's part of the problem. I would trade a bunch of intellect just for, for re believing the Bible, you know? Because if we allow our intellect to rule over what the scripture says, we have put ourselves in the postmodern camp. It's not that we're to check our brains at the door, but if we understand the scriptures, how it came about, how God has protected it all these years, if God, if he can create this world, if he can create you and I, if he can give us life as he has, if we, if we honestly believe those things, he can certainly protect and preserve his word, can't he? But you see, these folks don't think so. 
But he's jo joined with Brian McLaren, who's called the godfather of the emergent church movement. Tony Jones, you just saw Jay Baker, who's Jim Baker's son, Shane Claiborne, Jim Wallace, one of Obama's advisors, to create let Red Letter Christians. These folks, as I mentioned earlier, they want to they read from what Jesus said in the four gospels, but they don't want to read what he said in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Only the four gospels and only what Jesus said are trustworthy. Is that right, really? Well, it seems to me like the way the New Testament writers understood how the Old Testament scribes kept the scripture, they kept it the same way in the New Testament. Paul knew and understood that Peter was writing things that were inspired by God. Peter knew it. Luke says that Peter is writing as inspired by God. They knew it even when they were alive. And they kept the New Testament text. That's why eight of the 12 known gospels were rejected by the early church, because the early church knew what it believed. Today, if they were making up what's in the New Testament, there would be at least 10, maybe as many as all 12 of the Gospels by some of the more liberal thinkers. See, those eight other Gospels were, were heretical. They had a heresy in it. How did the church know? Because it heard the apostles and their disciples preach the doctrines of the faith over and over and over. And uh, when I go to a pastor's conference, I always encourage pastors Listen, you probably have a lot of pressure on you to stop preaching about the virgin birth and salvation by grace, but you need to be preaching it because your people need to know why they believe what they believe. Because all the silly stuff that I see being preached inside Christianity isn't going to hold people together when the chips are down in rough times that I believe are ahead. If you think it's tough today, I think we're into tougher times. It'll be the doctrines of the faith that will hold you together that will allow you to stand against adversity and persecution that may come. I'm talking about pre-trib, folks. I'm talking about before all those events. And if you don't think that's happening, then we need to, we probably need to talk about the 165,000 Christians who were martyred last year around the world, because here we don't understand that. Red letter Christians focus on the social justice issues and aspects, but ignoring the epistles, that's all the rest of the New Testament, the book of Acts, and the book of Revelation. It's interesting how we can just kind of pick and choose and cut and paste it. And I think these statements from one of Campola's books really will help you to understand it. We affirm our divinity. Just let that sink in. By doing what is worthy of God's and we affirm our humanity by taking risks only available to mortals. God had to become one of us before we could become heroic. Robert Schuller affirms our divinity yet does not deny our humanity. Isn't that what the gospel is? And to Dr. Campola, I would say absolutely not. That is not, what, it may be what the gospel has become or what you tried to make it into, but it's a different gospel. It doesn't match what the Bible says. Then he says, isn't God's message to sinful humanity that he sees in each of us a divine nature of such worth that he sacrificed his own son so that our divine potentialities might be realized? The hymn writer who taught us to sing Amazing Grace was all too ready to call himself a wretch for getting our divinity. I know. It is hard to believe that would fly in evangelical circles. That's published by a so-called evangelical publisher. This is a bold rebellion against the authority of Scripture. Neither the Bible's true or it's not. And if it's not true, why are we wasting our time here on a Sunday morning Kiwanis meeting? <laughs> Isn't it true? I mean, there's a game on right now for all you guys and you ladies could be doing something else. Why are we here if Jesus didn't live and die and raise in the grave? <clears throat> and if the Bible isn't accurate about it? You've got to ask yourself this question. Because these folks have decided those things aren't right, but they want a spiritual experience and they've attached Christianity and evangelicalism to it. That's what it comes down to. It is no exaggeration that postmodern emergent movement is a redefinition of Christianity and regardless of by what name they may call it, you've got to be able to spot it without somebody announcing with a badge on, hi, I'm an emergent. Or, hi, I'm a new ager, or whatever it is. You've got to be able to spot it. That's why it's important for us to understand these things and to get teaching on this. You wouldn't want to hear this every Sunday morning. I, I hope Pastor doesn't preach this every Sunday morning. But I know he, he's going to preach the doctrines of faith, but you do need to hear this kind of thing once in a while from another voice. This is the new liberalism. And when I'm talking liberalism, I'm not talking about politics, though there are some crossovers. Postmodern emergent Christianity isn't Christianity at all. I've been saying that on radio. 
been saying it on my, in my seminars, conferences, wherever I can in print. Uh, they're not going to listen to me. I don't expect uh, Campbell and the rest of them to stop calling themselves ev evangelicals or Christians. But what they're doing is not matching the scripture and is not Christianity. This is a counterfeit false religion. That's l it looks like it, but it's not. It sounds like it. They claim to be, but their claims are void because of what they've decided to believe, what they teach. They don't teach sound doctrine. And uh, Paul was clear to Titus what should be done with those who don't teach sound doctrine. We shouldn't be shocked or surprised when teachers like this become popularized inside of Christianity and draw disciples away after them. We shouldn't be surprised when this stuff is now presented on Christian radio, on Christian television, in the Christian bookstores, in the Christian media, in the Christian marketplace. Maybe that's part of the problem because a lot of money is made this way. We shouldn't be shocked or surprised and we shouldn't be disturbed when somebody like myself or your pastor or maybe some of you here expose this stuff exactly as the scripture doesn't ask, doesn't suggest, but demands that we do. You know, I love people, I love the truth. I love God first, but I love people enough to tell them the truth. I don't pat the Mormon on the head at my door and say, wow, we have a lot in common. I hope I give him enough that when he walks away, he doubts. And maybe that's all I can do. This summer I had a running conversation with a Mormon missionary It was in my neighborhood. I saw him several times. I'd pull the car over, we called each other by name. We had this discussion going on about the identity of Jesus because the Mormon Jesus is not the Christian Jesus. Mormonism is polytheistic. Christian, Christianity is monotheistic. There's so many differences. But yet they call themselves a more enlightened Christianity. This is the shift. This is how it's happened away from the authority of the Bible. You need to understand this. It's the postmodern playbook, which is what the title of this was when I first gave it to Pastor Joe, even though it's changed a little bit now. The postmodern church is built, as I said, to the 16 to 45 age group. That is really the target, though there might be some older in it. They're taught, because they've been taught in school, that the old ways are out, and really we should trust nothing. That's where the postmoderns are. That's a horrible way to live, in my opinion, to trust nothing. You know, I, I mean, I will let you down, and I'm going to admit it to you right up front so you can trust me. <laughs> I will let you down because I'm human. But the God that I serve won't let you down. That much I know. Relativism rules. They insist that nothing is absolute. They discount history, tradition, values. By definition, they're skeptical of completely, of almost everything around us. They abandon all past orthodoxies, and they want to do church a new way. At Solomon's church, uh, Solomon's uh, porch, it's called, over in Minneapolis, they sit in a large circle in easy chairs, I'm told. I've not been there, but I've seen pictures. And that's, uh, they, have, they have somebody who teaches in the middle, but then everybody gets a say about what they think is good or bad or right or wrong. Boy, that's trouble. Think of the confusion. When everybody gets, a, gets to chime in about what they think is right or wrong, everybody gets an opinion. They want to talk about life stories. I heard uh, um, an entire message by a, a, a very well-spoken, very intellectual, emergent writer at a free Methodist church in Seattle. He was so funny, so convincing, you couldn't help but like him. Like, I like Brian McLaren, I think he's a really nice guy. Paul Young, who wrote The Shack, talk about a nice guy. I wrote in my newsletter, he's the nicest heretic I'd met in a long time. <laughs> I, and I meant it because it's true. That's exactly what he is. He's a very nice guy, but he's a heretic. You know, it has nothing to do with how much I might like somebody. That's part of it right here. But I heard this guy in Seattle. He had life story after story after story after story, just like Paul Young of the Shack. Gives all these stories, and then he uses that as validation that God must be with him because all these nice things have happened. But never once was the scripture cracked open. Never once was there any inkling that had anything to do with evangelical faith. That's because biblical doctrine is ignored. It's disdained by many of them. You get the quotes, and I don't have a lot of quotes in here this morning, but you get the quotes and you understand that. You read their books, you understand that. I don't expect everybody here to go out and buy these books by the postmoderns. And if you're gonna get involved in any of this kind of research, you better know that God has called you before you dive in, because look out, you're, you're diving into spiritually heavy waters. So how is the change being made? We introduce life application tools. Now what could be wrong with that? 
a marriage seminar, an ongoing financial seminar. I, I like Dave uh, Ramsey. Nothing, nothing wrong, even though he looks like Brian McLaren. Nothing wrong with, you know, <laughs> he does. I mean, I, nothing wrong with some of this stuff. But don't you dare slap a scripture on the top and then claim you heard the gospel. Don't claim you had church. Nothing wrong with this being a, 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 an addition to the outreach of a church. Because people will come for some of these things. Marriage seminars, marriages are in trouble. They'll come for that. Financial seminars. Nothing wrong with that. But it's the way it's being used. It may be fine, but if you begin to abandon the expository doctrine of the faith, the doctrines and the expository teaching of the Bible, you're in trouble. So why is this change being made? You've gotten a little of this already. They're enamored with personal application. The pastors in the pulpits in postmodern churches or postmodern pastors have become enamored with personal application because they're told it'll be relevant to people. Relevant and pragmatic are a couple of words I am so sick of. How about you? I'm up to here with being relevant. Yeah, I want to be relevant, but Jesus is relevant, especially when you're facing death and everybody gets there. The death rate is still one per person, as Dr. Martin said. We all get there. It's very relevant. The things in life are relevant, but eternity is way more relevant. And if we fail to preach eternity and preach it as the scripture gives it to us, what good have we done if we help somebody's earthly life, if we teach the, the man to fish as we've all heard, but we didn't teach them about eternity? What did we do? So why is this going on? It's because the whole society is narcissistic. What have you done for me lately, church? It's all about me. Now come on, we've all seen it and we've all been desensitized to it. Because unless you've been living in a cave someplace without any television, without any internet, you've been conditioned to believe it's all about you. Why? There's pastors going to the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> I just got back two weeks ago. <laughs> First vacation I've taken in 35 years, and I have to tell on myself. <laughs> My wife couldn't believe it when I said, we're going. She said, you really did it. Like, she'd been waiting for all this time. You know, we've been married all this time. 35 years, and we have, uh, I didn't say any of that. We'll scratch that, won't we, Max? Okay. <laughs> Everything in the culture is about me. No, there's no, there's nothing wrong with, we're like, we need time away. Okay, we all know that. I'm teasing, you know that. But it's all about me. And the church is embracing this, but not the scripture. Pastors are embracing this. And why are they embracing this? Because they're told this is the way they will fill their churches up. And some of them are in such desperate debt, they've got to make sure the seats are full. Wow. Postmodernism, we're told. If we preach these things, the stuff that's all about me, I, 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 me, 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 it will lure the postmodern church back, or the postmodern group back to church. You know, when the emergent church began, it came out of the, are you familiar with the Leadership Network? Christianity Astray magazine? I, I mean today. <laughs> that's what Jay Markell calls it, Christianity Astray. Yeah, oh, well from them, they had something called the Young Leadership Network. And there's where the discussions that the emergent church sprung from. Brian McLaren was in that, so was Doug Paget. These people were looking for an answer as to why we had this gap in the church in that age bracket. And uh, it wasn't that uh, they thought maybe we should have different music or maybe, maybe we should uh, dress down a little bit when they started saying, well, you know, the virgin birth, that, that's something we don't have to talk about. Um, let's, uh, let's not talk about uh, these things. Oh, we don't want to talk about hell or the devil. And they started doing away with these doctrinal things. And they concocted a different religion and called it evangelical emergent Christianity. So what's our response got to be? Our responsibility is to stay on message even if parts of the church or part of the culture don't like it. It's unpopular. We can't help it. It's not my job necessarily to be a church growth expert to try to model what a mega church in California did and bring it here. It's not a pastor's job to do. That's not 
God is the one who brings the increase, amen? You can fill the seats and have the, the most empty spiritual group of people that are not being prepared for this life or eternity. You can fill up all the seats if you tell them what they want to hear. How many of you know that it's the job of the teacher to tell you what God says and what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear? And sometimes, I've been sitting in the audience before, and I've had the experience that that cuts me to the heart, what I just heard, because it brings conviction to me. It convicts me to change. It convicts me to, to think differently, to act differently. But today, people don't want that. They want to hear what they want to hear, and they want to be unknown by anybody. They want to slip in the back, slip out, not be known, do their own thing, claim they had church, and be deceived in the process. The switch is being made over time because the church doesn't know what its mission is and what the gospel really are. So if you teach this long enough, then you have a group of people who really don't know what they believe, and they've gotten used to it. They want to be relational. They want to do life together. A phrase we might use, and it might be fine. But where's the focus? On biblical values, on the absolutes of Scripture. When it comes to preaching, and this is one of the most important slides in the seminar, so if your neighbor's sleeping, please wake him up. <laughs> it's not always what's being said that's wrong. It's what's being left out that is mandatory to the authentic Christian message. And you know, you gotta be pretty sharp to recognize after a few weeks or a few messages that you're not hearing something that's mandatory like salvation by grace, for example. So it's not always what's being spoken, especially if it's being done in a very entertaining way, it's what's being left out. And I think that's a real important point that I've never heard anybody else discuss. I'm sure somebody has. I don't think I'm the only brain in the world that heard that from God, but I believe that that's something we've got to understand. The result, the eventual result, is a different gospel, void of essentials, deemed unhelpful to the postmodern mindset. So they've decided, they've been the gatekeeper about what truth is, about what right or wrong is. It's not the Bible, see? Here's what happens in the process. First, you've got to conclude that the church is broken. You've got to convince people that the church is broken. Now, if you've got 2,000 seats in your auditorium and you've got 500 people, it's easy to be convinced by your board that the church is broken. Because if you don't do something about it, you're gone. Because they have a debt, they have a mortgage, they've got to pay the bill. Then you introduce a new model. Here's how we're going to fix the brokenness, and then you promote it as church growth. Now, I've mentioned church growth once already, but in my mind, that's the culprit because really, this is where this whole thing started. It started in how are we going to get people back in the seats? And I've just got to say the whole modern church growth movement, honestly, I'd like to burn all the books, but I don't do that. It's a free, we have free speech, all right? They'd like to burn all mine, too. But the church growth movement is really liable for what's happened here. And they've gone as far, some of the church growth gurus have gone so far as to write papers on how you marginalize the resistors who are against the plan of the church growth gurus that are being brought in the church that the pastor is now being told is going to save his church and his job. Am I making sense? You marginalize those who want to stick with the Bible. You marginalize those who want to stand against the ideas. Now, there's some people that... Maybe they don't want the church to grow because it's their little group and they don't want anybody from the outside. That's wrong, right? But the idea of marginalizing those who are resisting the ideas of church growth generally, that's a problem. They want to undermine the organizational ability of the opposition. I, I know personally of a denomination in a small town in the Northwest that had a church and when they tried to bring a new pastor in, it was a denomination that brings the pastor in, the pastor is not elected by the church, they're brought by the denomination. The church didn't like the guy, they didn't want him because he was preaching postmodernism, and some of them understood it, and they resisted the changes he was trying to make to this church, a church of about 75 or 100 people. And so what, what did the denomination do? They closed the church. And six months later, they opened it with a new name, and with the pastor that they wanted in there because they were able to scatter the resistors who were going to stand in their way. 
And those resistors, let me remind you, some of them have been there 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Some of them had sunk their life, their time, and their money into that church. And this denomination decided they wanted to change what that church was. So they put the people out. Now tell me that's not evil. Evil happening right before us in the church. So, when did this start in the church? Well, church growth became the God and discipleship was put out the door. When church growth and not discipleship became the goal, it's our job to make disciples that can weather the storms of this life and prepare them for eternity. And I've said, look, I'd rather have 10 or 100 who knew what they believed and they were strong disciples and they were witnesses in their own right and doing the work of God and they were helping the hungry and clothing the naked and doing the things God calls us to do. I'd rather have 10 or 100 of those than 1,000 or 10,000 of those who don't know what they believe who are only along for the ride. But see, if, we only, if we're only in for church growth, we're in trouble. So here's a couple things to look out for. The downplaying of the authority and reliability and the importance of the Bible. Number one, first and foremost. Now you're probably not going to have too many of the postmodern stand at a pulpit and declare they don't believe the Bible or declare that a part of the Bible isn't reliable or claim they don't believe this doctrine or that doctrine oh, every once in a while. A few years ago, I was told by somebody who was actually in the building and the pastor of First Baptist Church of Dunn, North Carolina stood before his people one Sunday morning and declared he didn't believe that Jesus was God and didn't believe in the virgin birth. That's First Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church, by the way. And 200 of the people, of the 300 there, got up and left that morning. They literally got up out of their seats and walked out. But he is still the pastor there because the Southern Baptist, uh, for all the good things, and I have a lot of Southern Baptist friends, they have allowed liberals still in their midst to be ordained. He's still the pastor there after making that kind of a statement. The move away from Scripture looks and sounds a lot like what the liberals did 100, 150 years ago. As I said to you, it's the satanic redo. The Bible is inconsequential and it's secondary if it's correct at all. So not only do they not believe the Bible, then you see in their teaching, you see in the reflection of the church that the Bible is secondary. Number two, or A, and B, Social issues take precedent. We're all inter interested in social issues, but social issues take precedent. This is a satanic redo of how the devil destroyed, as I said, we'd see a slide of it, how he destroyed the mainline denominations 100 to 150 years ago. Number two, the redefinition of previously orthodox terms. If you keep using the same words that the old guard knows what it means, but then you've attached a new meaning to it without really explaining to anybody, you do it very slowly, then you redefine the orthodox terms and terminology. Like we said, evangelical has even changed. Evangelical previously meant bringing people to a personal relationship with Jesus for their eternity, but uh, now it means coming into a religious setting to experience a journey for our earthly lives. So again, get a definition if somebody uses the word evangelical and you uh, don't know them or don't know what they mean by it. Number three, they abandon orthodox doctrine. This is just, all this stuff's just a progression, as you see, you know? It, it, soon the terms don't mean the same thing, then the doctrines don't mean the same thing. And as I said a minute ago, the error by omission, I think is a big deal. If you don't know, if you don't know your Bible, uh, you'll be the one who will be in trouble. You need to test everything and hold on to what, that which is good. Paul was clear about it. Prove everything is what King James says. Test everything, I think the NIV says. Uh, test all things, I think is NASB. But it all means the same thing. Test everything. There's nothing wrong with that. Test everything by the scriptures. Number four, it's the redefinition of the mission purpose of the church is finally where you end up with this, right? And it's all made possible because their theology became corrupted when they did away with the Bible. They have a perverted view of who Jesus is and what he did. They certainly have a perverted view of the Holy Spirit. 
How many of you know that even in good evangelical churches, he's almost treated like an it sometimes. And then, of course, their ecclesiology is going to be messed up. They won't know what to do as a church body. If their theology, Christology, and pneumatology are out, and these words aren't over anybody's head here, you know, because this is the church right here. This is what the church is, what we believe. Who is the one who led us and died for our sins? The one who's now comforting us and our mission is what this is. All right, but there's a couple more things. The theological collapse. Where does this lead the church? Because if those four things I just gave on the screen are in play, then you have a lowered or a relative or non-existent standard of behavior, conduct, and practice in the church. Have you noticed that? Not that we're perfect, like I told you, I'll let you down. If you know me long enough, I'm human, I'm going to let you down. But now, this is okay. And every single postmodern emergent leader that I have read their books or done the research, every one of them, is pro-gay and pro-homosexual marriage. Doug Padgett was asked, is homosexuality incompatible with the Christian faith? He pastors in Minneapolis. And he said, no, being gay and Christian is not a contradiction in any way. And this is the standard. Jay Baker came to Minneapolis to start a church to embrace this. You see, when doctrine is exchanged for lies and the creation is worshipped instead of God, then the door is open for homosexuality to flourish. By the way, do I hate homosexuals? Absolutely not. Do I want them to get saved? Thank God they're getting saved. Not all, but some. I think of Dennis Jernigan. Do you know that name? The songwriter from Oklahoma City. Some of his worship songs have just meant so much to me. And he was a practicing homosexual who got saved and delivered. Boy, did he get delivered. He has 12 kids now. Boy, did he get delivered. <laughs> God is saving and changing the lives of people in that lifestyle. But we should have seen this coming. When men started being concerned about the earth and we got into the environmental movement and the earth was the main thing and the hippies started worshiping the earth, we should have seen what was going to happen because Romans 1 is a prophetic chronology that shows us when men worship the planet or the creation, the next thing that happens is it'll be men with men and women with women and the society will become doomed. We should have seen it coming 50 years ago. Go read Romans 1. You'll see what I mean. It's a chronology. This is what's going to happen. The next thing what happens is if we give, give up on theology and Christology and the things I mentioned earlier, the next thing is we go for mysticism because we need a spiritual experience. Right? We're looking for spiritual experiences. But as New Agers would tell you, without the cost of repenting of any sin, sin doesn't exist. That's what the New Agers would say. The rejection of the Bible and Orthodox Christianity opens the door for New Age mysticism. This is why we have labyrinths and yoga and chanting and Eastern mystical techniques and Lectio Divina, the sacred readings, and all these rituals and ideas being brought into the church. And one thing that we're being told, this is a return to ancient Christianity. You know, we're hearing about the ancient mystics of the 15th century and how we want to follow their lead. This is what the emergents are talking about. And when I've been told this, I, a guy came and argued with me one time, and I, actually it's happened many times, but one in particular where a guy came and argued with me and he said, we just want to go back to ancient Christianity. Why are you trying to stop us? And I said, oh, let's not stop at the 15th century. Let's go to the first century and let's see if Paul walked the labyrinth. Yeah. No, no. These guys have trailed off into mysticism and they believe somebody who claimed to be a Christian mystic in the Middle Ages. And they don't know the roots of this. It came from Tantric Buddhism. And they don't realize where this stuff came from. It comes from mythology. I'm not going to take a long time to talk about this, but really what happens is they're seeking out what the New Agers call centering and what in the occult we call the altered states. Because they're looking for a spiritual experience. But they don't have the scripture to back them up on it. But they want to call it Christian. These are students. By the way, this picture has now been taken off the internet. I wonder why. These are students in the stations of the labyrinth in their labyrinth laboratory at Treveca Nazarene College in Nashville. A denomination I never thought I'd say anything about and now they're teaching that uh, theistic evolution is true. They're teaching the idea that God um, uh, knows the past and knows the present but doesn't know the future. 
I mean, that's, that means a third of the Bible is out the window because prophecy doesn't uh, mean anything. I mean, this is the stuff being taught in the Nazarene schools. This is a blurring of the lines between other religions. That's the next thing that happens. Oh, sure, look what we've got in common with the Mormons. Oh, the Muslims, they believe in a Jesus, a Jesus. Talked a lot about that. I have a DVDs out there on that topic. They blur the lines. The ultimate supremacy of Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible, the work of the cross, the triumph of the resurrection. Those things are inconsequential because look what we've got in common. Oh, and they look at guys like me, biblical apologetics, which is defending the faith, and polemics, which is exposing false religion. They're viewed as negatives. They, I mean, postmoderns are not going to have me in their churches. Trust me. So postmodern emergence, they, uh, they sacrifice absolute truth because they want to appear more loving and more accepting because they've been taught that that's the job of, of people today. We've got to uh, accept what everybody else believes. I accept the right that they have to believe it, but I don't accept the fact that they're all going to go to hell with me standing by and saying, nice job. I don't accept that and you shouldn't either. It's our job to tell people the truth. And I think we have to do it in such a way that they see we're doing it not just to prove we're right. You know, a couple of my seminars on the New Age movement, I make the statement, please don't engage a New Ager if you're just trying to prove that you're right and he's wrong. They've got to know you care enough about them to tell, you, tell them the truth. And that should be our motivation because we love them and because we're trying to serve the Lord to show his truth to them. But see, we're narrow-minded to them. Some of these folks sincerely believe that there's little difference because they think, well, the Jesus of Islam must be the Jesus of Christianity. Only problem is the Jesus of Islam is going to be the enforcer for Allah to bring Islam to be the entire world's religion according to Islam. The Jesus of Islam is not deity, is not God incarnate. The Jesus of Islam didn't die on the cross and didn't raise in the grave. It's the same spelling, but it's a different Jesus. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4 would be a great passage for you to write down to go look at because there'll be different Jesuses, different Gospels, and different spirits. Paul warned the Corinthians. Different Jesuses. It's because somebody named Jesus, a lot of Spanish folks named Yesu. So somebody named Jesus doesn't mean Jesus Christ. And a lot of these folks just don't know any better. They really don't believe John 14, 6. They want to pick and choose attitude. That's why universalism is now being accepted in some of these circles. You're going to find, I mean, Rob Bell's book is a great example. Some of you know about it. It's called Love Wins. It came out in 2011. And even though he tried to dance around it and say he really didn't believe in universalism, he did say that he didn't believe in judgment and didn't believe that God would ever judge anybody. And I think that sounds like universalism to me. We all get in in the end. Wouldn't that be nice? And when the next time somebody says to you, and I won't belabor this, but the next time somebody says to you that, uh, oh, God's only a God of love, he would never judge anybody. All the other religions are okay too. What they're really saying is, Oh, you Christians, you have the worst of all gods who would sacrifice his own son for nothing because people could have gotten to God or heaven through Buddhism or Hinduism. Think about that. We have the worst of all gods who would send his son to that kind of a death for nothing. No, Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Brian McLaren doesn't like the idea of hell. He says that... Uh, you know, that's, that's not going to happen. He writes it in his books. He's made it clear. The emergence, they reinforce this all around. That DVD on universalism out there, I think is a very important one, hour and 20 minutes long. Number seven, I'm getting close to the end. I'm almost out of water. <laughs> <coughs> Algae medication I take all the time makes me thirsty. Most of the new evangelicals have no interest in or a perverted view of Bible prophecy. Boy, does that make them sitting ducks. I mean, will they be some of the ones that'll be on the platform behind the Antichrist when he's introduced to the world and they're going to verify that he's the one because they don't know any better? Many of these new evangelicals have no interest in it because they believe they're going to solve the problems of the world and in doing so facilitate the return of Christ. That's dominionism or kingdom now theology. And it fits perfectly in the postmodern mindset. Prophecy is ignored or mocked, and Israel is ignored and rejected. And I believe what the Bible says. 
I'll bless those who bless you, Abram, and I'll curse those who curse you. I just choose to be blessed. And that's why I'm a strong supporter of the state of Israel. And I've got a lot of compassion, and I want to evangelize the Palestinians. Let's get that right, too. 30% of the Bible becomes useless, like we said earlier. Replacement theology abounds, that the church has replaced Israel. We see that all over the place. And the church now stands unprepared if we don't believe in Bible prophecy. And these are some of the folks who have helped to lead the way on this. The second most recognizable Christian in the world, Rick Warren, is into Kingdom Now Theology. Robert Schuller, one of his mentors. C. Peter Wagner from the Church Growth Movement. Brian McLaren from the, from the Emergent Movement. You see him across the screen there. And a host of their disciples mock Bible prophecy. And again, why? Because they believe in Kingdom Now Dominionism. And prophecy gets in the way of that. See, if you believe what Jesus said in Luke 21 and Matthew 24 and what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and if you believe what the scripture says in the book of Revelation and you understand Daniel and the 70th week, and I won't teach it all, you've heard it I'm sure, if you believe this stuff you can not believe in kingdom now. But if you don't believe the Bible and believe you can discount parts of it, put it away and say it's not, couldn't be for today. Rick Warren here wrote in his book, in his seminal book, The Purpose Driven Life. And this is one of the many problems I've got with it. The biggest problem is he never mentions repentance as a prerequisite to salvation, but that's another story. He said, when the disciples wanted to talk about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission to the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I've given you. Focus on that. If you want Jesus to come back sooner, focus on fulfilling your mission, not figuring out prophecy. Well, where do I begin in debunking that? What does Dr. Warren do with this? Matthew 24. Why would Jesus explain the many end time signs as he did in Matthew 24 if we were not to be aware of them, especially if we see them coalescing in, our day, in a day like we're seeing in our day? We're seeing a convergence of end time signs like no other generation has. Pastor, I nearly called you this week and asked you if I could preach a new message I've got called 10 Reasons Why I Believe Jesus is Returning Soon because the coalescing of these signs tell me where we are in time. We'll not know the day or the hour, but we'll know the times, won't we, folks? What does he do with that? Jesus even ends this, this one part of this passage saying, watch therefore. Why, if we're not to watch for these signs, if we're not to understand the day we live in, just go along our merry way. Why did Jesus tell us to watch? I figure if Jesus told me to do something and I don't do it, and I know I should be because the scripture says, that's called sin. What do you think? Jesus said to do something or not to do something and we go against it, that's sin. What do you do with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Paul wrote to them. The second letter is to, to clarify that they hadn't been left behind because they were watching. They were watching and they'd been led astray by a false teacher. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which were asleep, those who had died previously. He didn't want them to be ignorant about these things. He wanted them to understand the day they live in. What do you do with Titus, the great letter to the pastors and leaders, looking for that blessed hope. Wow, we're supposed to be watching for him, aren't we? But yet a lot of the church isn't prepared. What do you do with the, the 10 virgins? Five who were, had their lamps trimmed full of the Spirit of God and five that didn't. We're to watch and we're to pray, the scripture says. We're to expect our hope, the blessed hope. That is my hope. My hope is not in this planet. It's not in me changing this planet to become all Christian, as the Kingdom Now folks would say. My hope is a blessed hope. It's not a fatalistic hope. Because if God fulfilled all of the many prophecies that he has fulfilled in minutest detail, he will fulfill the end time prophecies. Exactly as the word has said. 324 prophecies about the Messiah, many of them fulfilled in his first coming. What makes us think God's going to change gears now? Two special points here, and I'm going to play a short video clip that will be kind of a shock to some of you. There are people teaching, and have been for some time in our Bible colleges, that just by being part of the group, we are saved. Corporate or collective salvation. To my shock, I had a, a fellow in the audience last Sunday night in Missouri where I spoke, 
and I, I know this fellow. His wife is the manager of the Christian bookstore there in town. And he's a pastor, has been in the past. I'm not sure if he's in ministry today. But he went through a very well-known seminary in the Midwest. And it's a very, was a very strong evangelical seminary. And he said his, and this is 15, 20 years ago when he got his degree, and he said one of his theology professors in that seminary was going to retire to write a book about corporate salvation. Which I was just like, I, I'd heard things recently about that seminary about another professor. I was shocked, but that's the stuff. Look out for that. Because this is the thinking, oh, I'm just part of the group and I'm, God loves me and that's all I need. Right? Whatever happened to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Romans 9 and 10, or 10 verses 9 and 10. Whatever happened to that? Now, let's not argue about the Bible. Let's just focus on Jesus. Ever heard that? Now, the biggest churches in America are being taught that kind of stuff. And so, uh, Max, we're going to play the video here in a second if you want to prepare the audio. And then I'll give you a couple of comments. Uh, you're going to see Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son. Very popular postmodern pastor. He's the pastor at North Point, North Point Community Church. I have some notes here. With about 20,000 people in several campuses in Atlanta. And uh, I just want you to listen to this, and then we're going to go back through a, a little of it and talk about it, because it's pretty shocking. And I want you to watch for the, the double talk, the circular reasoning going on, okay? Uh, I, I've heard you do this um, a lot. When you talk about Adam and Eve, and you, you kind of address, hey, you may not believe in Adam and Eve, and, but you unpack it by going back to Jesus. Can you give us, I think that's a good example. Yeah, well, if I can take a step back and tell me if I'm not answering your question. I think that we have done previous generations, especially of children and high school students, a terrible disservice by the way we talk about the Bible. I remember my freshman English class at Georgia State University. We were talking about literature. It was a, it was a literature class, and one of the pieces of literature was the Bible. And my teacher was not an anti-religious person, but began to talk about the myth, the creation myth, other creation myths and without meaning to, began to slowly dismantle the faith of every single person in there who had grown up in church. When she was finished, all of us were convinced that there are many creation myths. The story of Adam and Eve is a creation myth. It's one of many. Let's move on to the next topic. Well, because of the way the scripture had been presented to me and probably everybody in that class, it's a house of cards. So as soon as you pull out one piece of the Bible to say, this is a myth, well then immediately it's like, well, what else in there? is myth. Mm -hmm. The foundation of our faith is not the scripture. The foundation of our faith is not the infallibility of the Bible. The foundation of our faith is something that happened in history, and the issue is always who is Jesus. That's always the issue. The scripture is simply a collection of ancient documents that tells us that story. So when we talk about the scriptures, and especially the um, reliability of the scriptures, I think any time that we can tie the Old Testament especially back to Jesus, we have done everybody, Christians and non-Christians alike, an incredible service by letting them know, you know what, you can believe that the Adam and Eve story is a creation myth, so what? Who is Jesus? Mm -hmm. And then to your point, when I deal with Adam and Eve, I'm quick to say, hey, this is one of those odd stories. This is that story you heard growing up about two naked people running around in a garden. And who can believe that? And there are many creation myths. But here's why I believe this actually happened. Not because the Bible says so, but because in the Gospels, Jesus talks about Adam and Eve. And it appears to me that he believed they were actually historical figures. And if he believed they were historical, I believe they were historical. Because anybody that can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just believe anything they say. Mm -hmm. So what have I communicated? I've communicated that even though we're going to talk about Genesis and the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. the issue is, who is Jesus? Right. And I think any time that we can read that small little apologetic into our teaching and preaching, it helps our high school students and it helps our college students understand the foundation of my faith is not an infallible Bible. It's something that happened in history. Jesus came into the world, walked on the earth, represented God, was God, and rose from the dead. And that's a very, very important piece, or a very, very important um, part of our approach uh, to the scripture every single week. Mm -hmm. So how do we know Jesus rose from the grave? If we can't trust Genesis, maybe we can't trust Matthew. Maybe we can't trust 
the, the account in Acts as he ascended in Acts 1. I'm glad that Andy Stanley believes that Adam and Eve existed. And uh, he does that because he believes what Jesus said. But he plants these great doubts about whether you can trust the Bible in the process of it. It's how he gets there. His handling of the Bible that's my concern. And this is really postmodernism on display when you see this. You have to understand. Note that he believed his professor at Georgia State. Maybe that was a problem. Maybe just going to Georgia State was a problem. And I could name any other university actually at this point. Because maybe that was the problem because he allowed that professor to take eminence over what the scripture says. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, listen very, very carefully. The Bible is never at the mercy of the intellectuals or the secular educational community. It's the other way around. The Bible is either true or it's not, and if it's not, don't come back to church. But if you want to take your chances with the bunch being looked at as the, the heralds of intellectualism in our schools today, I feel bad about it for you. You see, it's all or nothing. I've touched the button, naturally. It's all about not, I'm going the wrong way. It's all or nothing, folks. This is how process theology, theistic evolution, those things have got, gotten their way into our seminaries. This is why creationism and sound doctrine are not being taught because the seminary professor wants to be looked at with the same, uh, in the same light and get the accolades from his secular peers. So they, they can't believe that we've only been here less than 10,000 years. They gotta believe in evolution if they want that because they wouldn't be intellectuals otherwise because they've allowed their intellect to overrule what the scripture says. And Andy Stanley cannot have it both ways. Why is this a big deal? I didn't go back far enough, sorry. See, he believes what he heard about Jesus from the Bible, but he rejects the Bible. Did you catch that? Yeah. You know, and that's something that's very clear in this, and I don't know why somebody was just with, you know, just uh, kind of picking through what he said, can't figure this out, why, why his followers can't figure this out, but he can't have it both ways. Speaking of Adam and Eve, he said if you take one little piece out, it becomes a house of cards. But, but how do we know that you can trust what he believes about Jesus? He builds an entire case for faith around the gospel, saying that that's where our faith comes from. No, 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 our, our, from uh, Jesus only. No, it comes from what the scriptures re relate to us, what it tells us, and the reliability of the Old Testament as much as the New Testament. I believe his apologetic view, the idea of tying Jesus to the Old Testament, I do that, and that's very helpful. But not if I'm then gonna tear the Bible down in the process, right? If he says, I believe what the Old Testament taught about Adam and Eve, and, and because I believe in Jesus, well, I have to believe that too. Well, he's right about that. So I, I give him that, I understand that. But uh, it's the Bible. And here's what I don't think he understands. You can't separate Jesus from the Word. Why? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. How do you separate Jesus from His Word? Now remember, this is written right at the very end of the Old Testament era, right? But how do you separate it? Don't listen to anyone who tries to separate God from his own word. Who wants to say, I can believe this, but I won't believe that. Now, like I said in the very beginning, God can preserve his word. But it seems to me like we've heard this all before, because Lucifer in the garden said, hath God said. Of course, if you don't believe the story in the garden, then you believe Lucifer was a myth too. But what I see in the garden there is Lucifer... Um, uh, commandeers the body of a serpent and speaks, that's the first seance in history because that's the same stuff that a medium does in a seance today as his body is taken over or her body taken over by a demonic spirit. Same exact thing. Paul believed the scripture. This is Paul's position. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Paul believed the Old Testament scripture. 
Jesus obviously believed it because Jesus quotes from 24 of the Old Testament books. Did you know that? Do you know the New Testament quotes from 34 of the Old Testament books? And Jesus quotes 24 of them and validates each one by his talking of it, by his quoting of it. People like to say Daniel couldn't be uh, couldn't have been written by Daniel. Daniel was written by somebody in the second century. And yet Jesus says Daniel the prophet and quotes him from Daniel. I believe Jesus. I'm with Andy Stanley on this. I believe Jesus. But I don't believe in tearing down the Bible to get there. The bottom line here is don't ask somebody if they're an evangelical folks. Don't say, can I see your statement of faith? Because it may be fine. It may have been on their website for the last 15 years and maybe in print in a dusty corner for the last 35. It may look just great. Those can't be the questions we ask anymore. The question is, where is the Bible in your priorities? And is the Bible the ultimate source of authority in your life and your church? That is the questions we should ask. Those are the questions, to get my English correct, that we should ask. A few scriptures to ponder, and I'll let you just write these down. I'm not going to go through them. Here's just a few of the many scriptures we could use this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I mentioned earlier, test everything, not by your feelings, not by how wonderful you think the speaker is, or how well he presents, or how funny he is. Test everything to make sure it lines up with the Bible. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15. I mentioned verses 3 and 4 a few minutes ago. A little further in the passage, Paul says that even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. His ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. So again, it's incumbent upon us to test everything. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. You've all heard it. You all know it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would seem, seem to me that the emergence and postmoderns are very ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because they've decided it's on them to change it. Titus chapter 1, holding fast the faithful word that he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. And there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. That's the job of us, it's a, it's a dirty job. We don't want to, do, I don't want to, if it had been up to me, I'd be doing a series of seminars on the book of Acts. I'd be doing a series of seminars on the Sermon on the Mount. Instead, what am I doing? Apologetics, polemics. But the Bible says that the mouths of those who don't teach the truth must be stopped. They profess they know God, it says in verse 16, but by their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. And then he says back in verse 2, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. And that's incumbent on us. So with all that, here's a short conclusion. It's a false assertion that's been promoted that there's something unique about the postmodern generation and the church has to change to accommodate them. What a terrible disservice that is to the 20-something, 30-something people that really what's happened is by the thinking that we've got to change to accommodate them and then it grows into teaching them things that the Bible doesn't say and adding to it, adding to the teaching of the church things that the Bible doesn't teach, we end up with a different religion and those folks end up in hell. That's what happens. The premise, the Christian message is out of date and must be rediscovered to reach the postmoderns is completely flawed. The same problem that the postmoderns have and that every one of us have and that I had is have is the same exact thing and that's called sin. It's the sin nature we were born with and it can be overcome through the blood of the Lamb. Our sins can be forgiven. Doesn't mean we won't still battle. We all battle. But I'm forgiven. I can find forgiveness. I can find hope, rest, peace, truth. What a what a disservice we're doing to believe that we've got to change the Christian message to reach these people, to get them to church. And when we get them there, what are they going to hear? So what we filled up the church with the 20-something and 30-something people? Don't get too happy about it unless they're hearing the gospel being preached. Right? Because otherwise, like I said, it's just Christian Kiwanis Club. Nothing wrong with Kiwanis, by the way. The emergent church is a trap aimed at the flesh and the good intentions of the postmodern generation. In their quest to reach the postmoderns, these emergent leaders have rejected or failed to see that we are in the end of the end days. You know what's going to happen there? There is going to be an exodus away from the church. And I believe what we have seen 
in the last two or three generations of people is that exodus beginning to take place. And if you think a lot has taken place so far, oh no, it's just warming up. I believe that error will be the norm in the church. If it was called a Christian church, error will be the norm by the time it's all done. And we will be called the cultist because we believe the Bible. So we're not, we're not even close to being all the way into this. I don't know how fast it's going to go. I don't know. I just see the signs of the times, and all I can tell you is that's what's going on. But I think that's what's going to happen ahead. If somebody's going to ask me, I've been asked a lot, I believe that error becomes normal. By changing the core message of the church, the emergent leaders have sealed the eternal fate of the postmoderns who might have heard the gospel and received it otherwise. What a disservice. And this is the end. We who preach the gospel must not think of ourselves as public relations agents sent to establish goodwill between Christ and the world. We must not imagine ourselves commissioned to make Christ acceptable to big business, the press, the world of sports, or modern education. We are not diplomats, but prophets, and our message is not a compromise, but an ultimatum. And I have tweeted that a couple of times, and I may retweet it again, because I'm inspired every time I read what Toja wrote some 60 or so years ago now. It's, look at that, our message is not a compromise, but an ultimatum. Father, I thank you and praise you, Lord, that we can know truth. And we can know the truth giver. That we can look to the Redeemer. We praise you and we thank you, Lord, that you have protected and preserved your word, that redemption is available to everyone, salvation then to those who would confess him as Lord. I pray, Father, that each one of us examine our hearts. Do we know that we know him? Are we sure? We live in troubled times, Lord. We know the ark door is going to swing shut someday, just as it did in Noah's day. We're just grateful that today the ark is still open. Jesus is still calling. So I pray you touch each one of us, Lord. Help us. Speak to our hearts. I pray it in Jesus' name. Fellas, let me do this real quick. Uh, materials on the table. I have a 50-page 